And these attacks show um, how poor Russia's air defence is. I mean, it goes back to, was it 1972, Matthias Rust uh, was a young German lad who flew a light aircraft into Moscow and landed in Red Square as a stunt. And everybody said, how could they possibly allow that to happen? Well, here we are, you know, more than half a century later, and it can still happen. Um, a, a, a drone flying low and slow or a light aircraft flying low and slow is a different problem altogether. And the, it isn't just the, the, the techn technology of the systems, which isn't very good. Their own operation of them isn't very good because they've never thought that they would face this. They never thought they would face mm. the idea of, of attacks coming from you know, what used to be part of the Soviet Union into their own deep interior. And so the, the Ukrainians have been extremely impressive it's one of the, the few bright spots in the last couple of months in the way that they've been able to target Russia's facilities. But, of course, there's a high political price to pay for that. It's bothering the United States. It has upset the Russian refined petroleum products industry. The Russians are now going to Kazakhstan to get the Kazakhs to supply petrol and refined products because their own refining capacity has taken a real hit. Over You've mentioned um, Ukraine's uh, long-range strikes uh over the border into Russia itself. Can you tell us a bit more about the kind of long range drones that they're using successfully to strike deep inside Russia uh, from Ukraine and the possibility of this capability being expanded? Yeah, it's very interesting that the Ukrainians, because they're having to be inventive and they're using drones more and more. So they're using a lot of drones at the front line, the FPVs, they're called first person vision drones. And, and they are almost like um, in lieu of artillery shells. They're, they're using drones far more now uh, and most of, the, most of the Russian tanks they're taking out are with those sort of drones, tactical drones. But um, the ones they're using against Russia are a mixture of things. Some of them are uh, the old Tupolev um, drone, the, the old Soviet era drones, which they've re that, that used to be uh, purely non-lethal and they've made it very lethal. And it's, it's an old Russian jet, basically. So they've used some of those. They've built their own drones with quite a long um, range and they've used light aircraft. They've now discovered that you can robotically fly a perfectly good little Cessna light aircraft, pack it with explosives. It's got a very big warhead. And so they've attacked refineries deep inside Russia um, using all of those different things because a light aircraft um, has got such a low radar signature and it, fly, it can make it fly slowly and erratically towards the target. Um, and it can all be done remotely. And they've been extremely inventive about that. And there's some very dramatic um, footage out there of little light Cessna aircraft <laughs> flying into a refinery and a huge explosion resulting uh, from it. That kind of attack, and, and the one that we saw recently on the 2nd of April, where, where a drone is reported to have travelled 800 miles into Russia, um, hugely embarrassing for President Putin. Yeah, and these attacks show um, how poor Russia's air defence is. I mean, it goes back to, was it 1972, Matthias Rust uh, was a young German lad who flew a light aircraft into Moscow and landed in Red Square as a stunt. And everybody said, how could they possibly allow that to happen? Well, here we are, you know, more than half a century later, and it can still happen. Russia's air defense is scaled against American high-tech systems. That's, that's their, their target. And anything that isn't an American high-tech system has got quite a good chance of getting through. And so it's a mixture of the wrong sort of defense systems they've got, they've got the, and they've got these panzer um, anti-missile systems, We've got three of them in Moscow that all overlap, but they're against incoming missiles. Um, a, a, a drone flying low and slow or a light aircraft flying low and slow is a different problem altogether. And it isn't just the, the, the techn technology of the systems, which isn't very good. Their own operation of them isn't very good because they've never thought that they would face this. They never thought they would face mm. the idea of, of attacks coming from you know, what used to be part of the Soviet Union into their own deep interior. And so the, the Ukrainians have been extremely impressive. It's one of the, the few bright spots in the last couple of months in the way that they've been able to target Russia's facilities. But of course, there's a high political price to pay for that. It's bothering the United States. It has upset the Russian refined petroleum products industry. The Russians are now going to Kazakhstan to get the Kazakhs to supply petrol and refined mm -hmm. products because their own refining capacity has taken a real hit over the last two months. Um, another piece of uh, p optimistic news for Ukraine is this uh, £200 million investment by UK and Latvia um, supplying long-range drones with automatic target recognition. Um, how will they operate uh, and what kind of difference will they make? Yeah, they, they will operate and they can make a difference. Um, 
drones, particularly long range drones, always use different sorts of navigation. So uh, inertial navigation, where you just set it, set a drone off on a course, is the is the obvious thing to do. But at some point, a drone's then got to look down and see what's there and and map it against what um, the operators know is there to find its target and so on. And of course, it can be can be jammed. But what the Ukrainians are finding is that their own civilian technologies are better than some of the military technologies of the West. I mean, they're finding, for instance, that American drones that they've been sent or given are tend to be rather clumsy. They're not as, as capable, actually, as the ones they've developed themselves. And so this British-Estonian arrangement is an attempt also to bring in this very inventive high-tech sector that the Ukrainians themselves have got and the Estonians are pretty good at to bring that sort of civil technology into long-range, very accurate drones and ones that can't easily be um, jammed because it, you know in the early days of the war they put a gps uh, tracker on the front of a drone and that was okay but the russians are quite good at at, at frustrating gps gps trackers over a long distance so if they've got long enough to see the drone moving they can do something about the gps signals um in, in terms of, of david cameron's visit to the u.s um He's trying to get this uh, this uh, aid deal that you mentioned, the $61 billion U.S. package approved. President Zelensky has said without it, Ukraine will lose the war. And he will be wanting to pay, paint that worst case scenario, won't he, to secure that package. I is he right? I think he's right that if he doesn't get that um, package, that Ukraine will lose this year of the war, which means they'll lose more territory. Um, and then it becomes a question of whether Zelensky stays in power. Um, what the Russians are hoping for, I think, is not that they could march to Kiev and take it over this year, but that they could put so much pressure all the way round on, uh, on, on Ukraine that there would be um, a political coup in effect in Kiev. Zelensky would be removed and he'd be replaced by somebody who would do a deal. I think that's what they're probably hoping for this year. If the American aid package comes through, that almost certainly won't happen. If it doesn't come through, there's a fair danger that it will happen. Um, and other aid, I mean, the, the EU aid um, that is being proposed, I mean, 50 billion euros is coming through in stages. NATO's own plan, this um, uh, NATO mission on Ukraine, as Stoltenberg talks about it, is 100 billion over five years. And even if that's agreed at the NATO summit in, um, in Washington in the summer, um, that will come in in stages. Um, the problem is that, that all of this is drip feeding Ukraine and making life for Zelensky much harder. If Zelensky could, could get the hit of one big aid package, which will keep Ukraine going, then he keeps his job. If it looks as if for all of his grandstanding around the world, the world is still not prepared to support Ukraine enough, then his job is on the line. And that's really what it comes down to. He needs the political popularity of bringing the world to support Ukraine. And that's not just a financial issue, it's a morale issue. If the Ukrainians feel that the world is really supporting them, the outside Western world is really supporting them, they'll sign up to fight. But if they feel that the world is turning their back on Ukraine and that they are going to lose anyway this year and maybe next year, then why, why turn up to fight? Why not just accept the inevitable? And so in that respect, this aid package is really, really important. One other point, um, is that there is increasing interest in having Japan step in also to provide aid because Japan, interestingly, as an Asian power, sees the Ukraine crisis in exactly the same way as NATO sees it and as the Biden administration in the United States sees it. So although Japan is a long way away and the other end of the, the, other end of the globe from the Ukraine crisis, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that Ukraine could do everybody, uh, that Japan could do everybody a favor and step in with a, a significant financial package. How likely is that looking at the moment? It's a proposal, and um, Kishida, the uh, Ukrainian... Ugh, I keep saying Ukraine, I'll say that again. It's a proposal, and the Japanese Prime Minister, Mr Kishida, is in Washington. I don't think they're going to make any announcements about anything like that, but the, I think they may be talking about it and discussing it. And there's a lot of interest in building on this Japanese determination to help the West keep Russia contained because they know that a, an ascendant Russia will also bolster an ascendant China. And then the Taiwan crisis gets worse, the whole East Asia crisis or East Asia tensions get worse. And so just as the Western world has, has as it were, at least drawn a line in the sand officially over Ukraine, 
Japan seems inclined to draw that same line in the sand for the same reasons. A line in the sand. Where do you think Western thinking is on Ukraine? Is it to give Ukraine just enough to stop short of victory but enforce a stalemate um, so that a settlement can be found? It's unthinkable uh, to many Ukrainians, but how avoidable is it? I think the West feels that if the Ukrainians eventually go to some sort of ceasefire or peace talks on favourable terms to them, then that will be good enough. But only the Ukrainians can decide when they're prepared to negotiate. They shouldn't have to negotiate under duress with 15% of their territory being having been invaded by uh, a foreign power. And so um, there is that sort of sense that the, the line in the sand is to support whatever Ukraine's, de whatever Ukraine's decision is about what Ukraine decides is effectively the line of victory. But that, of course, is a rather um, movable line. And that's one of the problems for the West, is that we talk about these terms, we'll back Ukraine for as long as it takes, we'll do whatever it takes. We say that, but we don't know in our own minds um, what that really means. As I say, I've got a very clear view in my mind what that means, but that's not the same as, as the um, most states people in Europe, or even in Kiev for that matter. That actually Russia um, um, is nervous uh, about groups like Hamas. Um, that it's not just because of its own restless Islamic things going on, um, but also. Um, uh, because it it for it it wants it wants a foothold in the Middle East, but it doesn't want a massive. It it doesn't want to clean up clean up Middle Eastern wars. It knows that that's the route route to disaster for it. But I just wonder as well, Roger, whether it is possible that part of the motivation for Israel making this strike on on the consulate was to remind its Western allies that whilst there is a lot of legitimate criticism of what Israel is doing at the moment in Gaza when it's taking the fight to Hamas, that in essence, that is not so much a fight against Hamas per se, it's a proxy war with Iran. And by focusing attention again on the Iranians, that just reminds America and the UK that that, that is the wider context. Yes, yes, uh, that, that, I, I share that opinion completely. I, I mean, uh, they are... The Israelis are trying also to shape uh, the way that Gaza is seen, the Gaza conflict is seen in the eyes of the American electorate. Um, and the American electorate, you know, as, as far as Israel can control that at all, really, uh, it can control it by persuading them that Iran is... is, is uh, you know, they call it um, the octopus, you know, uh, that's to say the, br the central brain uh, uh, is, is the head and Iran is the head of the octopus and the tentacles, which, by the way, I think, I'm not much of an expert in, in, in octopuses, but I think each tentacle has its own own kind of nervous, independent nervous system. That's to say, if you cut off one of the tentacles, it can grow a new one. Um, um, so uh, <laughs> without getting too tangled in, in kind of Nemo-like um, discussions, it, that's the point. That, this is the image you have, to, you have to persuade the two candidates for American president is the correct one. That's to say it's not just Hamas. Yeah? Um, it's, the, it's the people who control the various tentacles that are being used to uh, squeeze the breath out of Israel. And, and that's, uh, and it's, of course, it's, it's kind of tactical in the media age. It's tactical to say, well, yes, we, perhaps we're not behaving beautifully. Um, uh, perhaps we have committed errors uh, and so on, but look away from that for now because the, the fundamental act that is prompting all this is October the 7th, uh, the atrocities, um, um, and who was behind October the 7th? Um, 
uh, because Hamas could not have constructed a, um, a, you know, it wasn't an act of anarchy, although it was, you know, in its execution it was it was anarchic but it was something that had been worked out and and the impl impl clear implication is that it was worked out in, in the knowledge of iran um iran denies it other people deny it but that's clearly how it has to work and the same goes for all of the proxies the houthis in yemen um, they were they were always new, you know. They they had their own tradition of fighting, and uh, 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 but Iran gave them the weapons, the training, and uh, and pointed them in the direction that was interesting for Iran. So the first thing, you know, long before the Hamas attack, Houthis had uh, hit a Saudi oil refinery with uh, with really quite sophisticated drone swarming uh, tactics and making a, making a complete fool out of Saudi Arabia, which spends billions and billions and billions on air defense. Um, so, uh, so it's trying to shift the debate a little bit. It's trying to shift the discussion. Um, uh, and it does, you know, Israel does invest a lot in... Uh, in lobbying uh, in in America, f exactly for this reason, it it wants to make sure that the debate doesn't move in the way that a lot of the uh, the left wing of the Democratic Party would would want, which is um, um, uh, you know arms embargo, um, uh, ceasefire, leading to peace agreement um, that sees Israel, uh, you know, uh, accept the notion of a two-state um, two country and, and an upgrading of the Palestinian presence. None of this Israel wants, and so it has to stop the first step. Um, and, um, and that's... And that's why these kind of acts happen. Yeah, I, you know, it would be madness to think that that uh, attack on an Iranian that assassination, essentially, of an Iranian general, is the last one. It, it, it'll be part of a pattern now to just to prod the memory of the superpowers that Iran is a big problem, and it could be. And this is without getting too, you know, tangled up about this. But it could be that Russia also accepts this part of the uh, part of the message that that actually Russia um, um, is nervous uh, about groups like Hamas um, that it's not just because of its own restless Islamic things going on um, but also um, uh because it it for it it wants it wants a foothold in the middle east but it doesn't want a massive it it doesn't want to clean up clean up middle eastern wars it knows that that's the route route to disaster for it a couple of quick things to to round up um roger first of all do you think there is any scenario in which a u.s government or maybe slightly more likely a uk government would suspend the sale of arms to israel uh, well it looked for a while that we might go in that direction um and part of the reason reasoning is that people are trying to the part of the reasoning is there are election campaigns across the world yeah and uh, no one has quite worked out um, what the impact of the mobilization of young voters is, uh, especially in multi uh, multi ethnic societies, uh, of uh, televised and TikToked uh, and YouTubed uh, depictions of Muslims being killed uh, en masse. Um, uh, in Gaza, or frankly anywhere, but but 
Gaza. And uh, it, it, does, it does, as we saw uh, under Jeremy Corbyn, for example, uh, have the capacity to bring people out on the streets and, uh, and to make people care about politics in the way they don't much care about British politics, but they do care weirdly uh, about, um, about these particular um, uh, atrocities. So people haven't quite worked out what, you know, where this leads, what, what does it mean in terms of lost voters, uh, you know, uh, you know, or, or even in local council, you know, will it somehow help Sadiq Khan? You know, Sadiq mm. Khan doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't hold back from saying that, you know, uh, horrible things are happening in Gaza. Okay. What we're seeing here is, is fairly uh, simple. It's a, an adapted ultralight aircraft. Um, I believe it's a, a A22 Foxbat. Um, essentially, a cheap and cheerful um, private propeller plane, uh, which has been adapted for use as a one-way attack uh, UAV. Uh, so much as the uh, sort of purpose-designed Iranian Shahed 136s are a sort of standard component of Russia's air campaign against Ukraine, uh, Ukraine has been developing a, a range of uh, one-way attack UAVs um, from quite small systems uh, to things that clearly <laughs> that are adapted from ultralight aircraft, which for one-way attack UAVs are, are on the sort of larger, larger end of things. The, the basic relationship between range and therefore reach against targets at, at distance uh, and size is that the larger something is, the more fuel it can carry and the more payload in terms of warhead uh, you can pack in for a given um, level of performance, if that makes sense. You're always going to be trading off um, weight that you can carry and fuel um, with performance. So if you want something to go uh, hundreds of kilometers at quite high speeds, it's going to have to be jet powered and that will give you a, um, a fuel burn that means you're going to end up with something about the size of a cruise missile um, at minimum. If you want something that is much smaller that will go the same distance, you'll typically have to accept a much slower speed, um, <clears throat> which means that you're dealing with a lot less drag and you're having to put in a lot less power for any given kind of time period. Uh, that means you'll have a lot slower transit, of course. Um, but that is why uh, most of these kind of one-way attack systems that are designed to be relatively cheap and, and used in large numbers are propeller powered slow uh, and therefore can cover significant distance, even though some of them are quite small. So the, the Shahed 136 is about 200 kilograms. It's not tiny. But compared to an aircraft, it, it's pretty small. Um, that can go more than a thousand kilometers. Clearly, in this case, the Ukrainians have taken a, uh, a an ultralight airplane, um, which typically you might expect to be able to fly for maybe three, four hours. Um, that would be with an with an hour of um, fuel margin if you were flying it as a light airplane, because you have to have a fuel margin. Obviously, for a one-way attack system, that's not a concern. Um, and they've put uh, what looks like a probably 20 to 30 kilogram warhead in there in terms of the, the, the blast, probably closer to 30. Um, in some ways, these systems are, are very simple, but in, in the sense that they just need to fly to a given point, probably using GPS uh, or, or GLONASS, the, the Russian equivalent, and then go into the ground at that point. On the other hand, the, the kind of considerations around when they work and, and how they work and in terms of their effectiveness are really quite complicated because for a start, flying slowly may actually help in some cases to get past older air defense systems because radars uh, use what's called, what are called Doppler gates to try and filter out because a radar is sending out um, to, to try and um, detect air threats. A radar is sending out energy uh, and essentially receiving back all of the echoes from that energy bouncing off things. Radars don't want to have to display, uh, well, you, you don't want your radar to have to display, you know, the ground, trees, birds, clouds, uh, depending on the, the frequencies that you're using, uh, they might reflect as well. And so essentially most radars for, for air defense work or, or for fighter aircraft will use Doppler to basically filter out all the returns 
that don't exhibit a shift over time from something moving at a given speed. So if something's moving either fast towards you or fast away from you, there will be a, a Doppler shift um, evident in, the, in the, the returns. And so most radars will simply drop things. In other words, they won't display, they won't track um, things that sit outside a given speed range. So if it's, a, if it's an air defense radar, you might uh, have the radar designed to pick up anything between about 100, 100 miles an hour and one and a half thousand, let's say. Um, and if it's a ballistic missile radar, you'd probably go even faster, or would go even faster. Um, so if you're dealing with really slow flying things, unless operators know that there is a slow flying threat that they need to potentially be concerned about, the radar may simply filter it out as kind of background clutter uh, and therefore not display. So in some cases, slow aircraft actually are, or slow UAVs are actually more difficult to defend against. Um, it is possible, particularly with modern radar, radars with a lot more digital uh, control over the signal and the processing of it, to have really much wider Doppler gates. And so most Russian systems, in terms of the, the, the most up-to-date stuff, are actually able to track these things, at least most of the time. But even then, you typically still have to be widening the Doppler gates more than you'd like uh, in terms of making sure you've got that coverage. And what that will mean is that there will be a lot more clutter and a lot more kind of junk returns that than operators would like because they're having to, to cover for things that are moving pretty slowly and therefore they're getting a lot of returns from other things in, in, in the, um, the environment. There's also, of course, the case of electronic warfare. So both sides in Ukraine, but particularly Russia, use electronic warfare extensively. Um, the most common being simply the jamming of GPS uh, signals. So if you are flying a UAV uh, and it navigates using GPS, which a lot of commercial UAVs and a lot of the commercial GPS software and, and chips, which are used to adapt um, you know, whatever it might be, UAVs, light aircraft, etc., for these, these military purposes, uh, will simply not function if GPS jamming equipment is being used around them. Um, you can play around with a sort of a mix of an inertial navigation system, which basically measures or tries to measure distance and speed and heading over time. As long as you know where you were when you started, then you can kind of, um, with increasing errors over time, you can navigate uh, with an automatic system. Now, that might enable you to get through an area where there's quite a lot of GPS jamming. And then hopefully once you're past the area where GPS is being jammed, as long as the error that's accumulated is not too big, then the system may be able to then pick up a GPS signal again and thereby correct its position. Um, so there are ways to navigate through the EW, um, but it's again a huge constraint on where and, and how ubiquitously these sort of UAVs from the very small up to the rather larger like this can be used. In some ways, striking target in the really deep areas is, is perhaps easier because you know this was not one of Russia's key, for example, bases. And so this far inside Russia, it's unlikely there'd be much in the way of air defense systems there. There's a finite number of SAM systems that Russia has and, and operators and capacity, so they can't defend everything. And it's far enough back that the uh, costs of imposing GPS jamming, for example, in that part of Russia uh, were probably assessed as higher than the benefit likely to be gained from any uh, you know, protection because they didn't think it would come under attack. Um, so yeah, the, these Ukrainian long-range UAVs are something that Russia is going to struggle to completely defend against because you can't put air defense everywhere, you can't put EW effects everywhere, and certainly not all the time. But at the same time, it's probably important not to overstate how effective these things can be. They impose damage, they impose cost, but they're not going to have strategically decisive effects. You know, if you look at Ukraine itself, Ukraine has taken about eight and a half thousand missile and one-way attack UAV strikes over the last two years. Ukraine is a significantly smaller country than Russia. It was a significantly less resilient in terms of the, the pre-war state um, country than Russia can be. Um, and so, you know, given that Ukraine is still fighting and of course has taken huge damage, but is, is still able to continue the war, we probably shouldn't overstate how much attacks on secondary targets that are not as worth defending in the depth of Russia that cause inconvenience, how much effect that's actually going to have on the overall war. Um, but, you know, we've also seen the Ukrainians use these systems against arguably more important targets. 
Uh, so, for example, uh, attacks over the last week against a number of uh, Russian Air Force bases, uh, including their, their, one of their primary bases for um, their Sukhoi 34, which is the, the primary attack jet, which reportedly caused some losses. There you would have to use, <coughs> there would be air defenses. And so rather than having kind of adapted things like this light aircraft attack, where you're just getting a long range thing with a, a clever navigation solution to a distant, not particularly defended target because they can't defend everything. If you're going after things like air bases, you have to use a large number of weapons and rely on essentially suppression of the defenses through saturating their capacity. They can't engage all of them coming in at the same time because either they're coming in from multiple directions or and or uh, there are just enough of them that the SAM systems in, in place run out of ready to fire interceptors and have to reload, which will take a, a while. So uh, there, the systems may be cheap, but you have to use a really large number of them in order to have the effect uh, because you need to get through defenses. And in that sort of complex attack, you're much more dependent on what the electronic warfare environment is as well and what your seekers are, because if the Russians know that they're under attack by a really large wave of UAVs, it's really worth their while um, jamming as much of the spectrum as they can for the period that the attack is underway, even though it might degrade their own capabilities and potentially expose the location of EW systems. Um, I guess in summary, the, the more you, the, the, the use of UAVs in general, in, in sort of large scale use of cheap adapted UAV technology, can present a lot of novel problems for militaries. And if militaries don't have any defensive capabilities, they can be hugely uh, damaging. But the more you rely on them as a core part of your military effect, your sort of toolbox, if you like, the more worth the enemy's while it is to develop and to use countermeasures at scale against them. And if the physics problem essentially that you're presenting the enemy with is how do I deal with lots of small UAVs? And that's one of their main problem sets. That's actually not a hugely difficult one to do. So the development of counter UAV technologies is probably going to increase dramatically following well, as the war goes on and following the experiences of the war. If you compare that as a challenge to, for example, ballistic missile defense, where you're trying to hit an incoming thing moving at several thousand miles an hour with an incredibly tight window with angles that are extremely difficult to predict ahead of time with an, another rocket that physically smashes into it, you know, that as a physics problem is massively more difficult than defending against small UAVs. The reason they're problematic and seen as so difficult by a lot of Western militaries is they're a threat that we haven't really focused enough attention on over the past couple of decades. And so we don't have, for example, ubiquitous short range air defense systems in most of our Western military um, formations. That will change, I suspect, but yeah, it's um, it's a problem set we haven't looked at for a while. One of the political prisoners said that Russia's descended to full tyranny dictatorship in the last two years. It's even got worse since you and I last spoke last summer. So I think he can continue to keep a suppression on that. We saw the elections were rigged. We saw the numbers of votes were ludicrously high, whatever it was, 84, 85%. He has a very large security machine, which continued to stamp down. The um, opposition has been effectively, um, I don't want to use that word, uh, decapitated. Uh, the opposition has been completely demoralized and divided and sent into exile and imprisoned. There is no opposition. There are, is, there are no alternative sources of information inside Russia. Russia is doing more and more in the Kremlin to clamp down on the internet and distribution ideas. There's purgings going on. Um, they're going after the LGBT, any other minorities, including religious minorities, to prop up the regime. So unfortunately, I think the trajectory is still further downwards. And on, to complement that, there's an extraordinary piece of news in the Times this week. The President Putin is now portraying himself a bit like Jesus Christ. He's explaining his divine mission, schooling Russia's youth in traditional values against the satanic West. Mm -hmm. This was as he, um, he celebrated the opening of, of new youth centres across the country. Um, how is he using religion to prop up his regime and mould the future generations? Well, I think, firstly, I don't think Mr. Putin is particularly religious. I mean, he never had a great history of 
of the religious belief, but it's been used as a sort of tactic to, and cynical tactic to buy support from the population, 70% of whom say they are Russian Orthodox. Uh, so he pronounces himself, he portrays, he sees, he's portrayed more in church, you know, as, as a man of piety. He lights candles. Um, he makes statements like, you know, crazy religious statements, as you mentioned. But I don't think he's living a particularly Christian life in either his behaviour or in his heart. If you, you know, I read the thing the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote about after visiting Ukraine about Christian values of love and mercy and grace, the care for suffering, the care for little children, and and the wish for peace. None of which Putin's observing. But I think he's using religion as another weapon to bind the population to him. Two years, um, three years ago, they published the national security strategy, and in there was lots of talk about traditional values, including orthodoxy. And he uses the Russian Orthodox Church as his agent to spread the message of Holy Russia, Russia under attack, in return for their support. So, Orthodoxy is part of his messianic mission to make make Russia great again through sort of muscular Christianity, portraying Russia and himself as good and portraying ourselves as evil. And you saw that that statement the Russian Orthodox Church adopted. In that light then, do you see this as, as a cynical propaganda manoeuvre manoeuvre by the Russian president rather than a sign that he's becoming delusional? Well, I mean, we always have this great discussion about what, you know, how, how rational Mr Putin is. I mean, he has been making some pretty strange statements since his re-election, both on election night when his face looked, I would thought, a bit peculiar. He's obviously become a bit convinced of his own, um, his, his own, um, he's become, a, he's become a convinced, sorry, of his own um, mission, his own destiny, that he's a man of destiny, that he's Vladimir the Great. And so I think that statement, statements about after the wake of the terrorist attacks in the Crocus uh, Hall, when he said there was no history of terrorist attacks in Russia, his statements about um, the church, you know, his mission about Ukraine, I think will point to, should we say, somebody becoming convinced of his own PR. And I think we should be factoring that in uh, as he enters his current term. Just to, to talk briefly about um, the way Ukraine is fighting the war right now, and it is increasingly taking the war to Russia with its long-range attacks on oil refineries and military facilities supporting Russia's air campaign. The attacks on oil refining, refineries causing a fuel crisis, while ammunition and artillery shortages hamper Ukraine's ability to go on the offensive along the front lines. How effective is this? Yes, well, I think obviously both Russia and Ukraine have been attacking attacking so-called strategic targets. So as you said, Russia's been attacking military industrial complex, command and control, air defense, uh, energy sites. And Ukraine has been trying to strike targets behind the front line to gain advantage. Now, it lacks the tools to do that because of the paucity of weapons and the unwillingness of Germany to provide similar weapons to Ukraine and its problem with the Americans. So it's using its drones against these refineries. I think, personally, I think it's a very clever strategy. Um, targets key vulnerability in the Russian system that Russia produces a huge amount of crude oil, exports a lot for to other countries, including China, and it keeps some back to refine for products from like unleaded and diesel and lubricants and aviation fuel, and all the things we use oil for. And those refineries have a single point of failure, which is the refining tower. So Ukrainian strikes have both increased the prices and reduced the supply of those products over the last couple of weeks. And I think they're a legitimate military target. Those products support directly Putin's war machine. The UK and the US have targeted those similar facilities in the Second World War and the First Gulf War during the Kosovo campaign and the Second Gulf War. These are known contributors, these facilities, contributors to mobility and sustainment on the battlefield. The problem that I, I worry about is that Ukraine doesn't have the capability to repeatedly hit them. So we, we, normally in an air campaign, it's not just one hit, it's 
second, third, fourth to make sure these things are knocked out and to stop the Russians from rebuilding them. So I think the Russians have got problems rebuilding them anyway because lack of access to technology due to sanctions. But we'll have to see how it plays through on the battlefield. Russia's got alternative suppliers from Belarus and can import products from members of its axis. And um, as Ukraine um, constantly tries to find new ways uh, to uh, keep the pressure up on Russia as it waits for those vital supplies of artillery and ammunition. Um, the UK has just signed this framework agreement to cooperate in the Defence and Arms Production Centre to help inside Ukraine itself. BAE Systems would, for instance, conduct maintenance, uh, repair and overall light guns on the ground in Ukraine. And there have been many drone uh, producers present at this conference. Time, though, is of the f- essence. Um, in spite of this uh, partnership, can, can it make a difference or is this for longer term? I think it's for longer term. I, mean, I, I read the speech of General Kavali, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, yesterday. And he said, at, at present, Ukraine cannot produce the weapons it needs to defend itself. It has to rely on foreign supply. Now, Germany, UK, France, America, and, and private business themselves have put in arrangements to do more of the production and maintenance and supply, support inside Ukraine itself. But that, that's going to take a number of years to play through so there's a gap between now where ukraine's on the back foot being bombed heavily and being ground back on the donbass and the supply coming on and i think that's where the u.s support 61 billion is absolutely critical without those weapons i think ukraine's chances of victory are zero and i think uh, there's a good chance that Putin will, can smell victory given those delays and dithering in Congress. Now, 2024 is a critical year for all in this war. If we don't support Ukraine this year, Ukraine may not be surviving until 2025. You mentioned um, in an interview elsewhere that the kind of appeasement of Putin we've seen by the West would not have happened under Reagan or Kennedy, certainly not under Churchill, I'm sure. But what when you look at the desperate situation today that Ukraine finds itself in formalism, it's often getting it too late, uh, it's, but it's hanging on. And, and there are rumours of trying to push Ukraine into a negotiated peace settlement. Where and what gives you the most optimism at the moment? There's a lot of gloom about it. I think the optimism I would take is you know, the spirit and will of the Ukrainian people to defend themselves, defend their, their own values, their democracy, their country. As we've seen, um, notwithstanding the difficulty on, in the battlefield, Ukrainian troops are providing you know, stirring defences. Um, and I think the public and the Ukrainian people behind them. So I'm optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic about <laughs> the, the position in the US, but things could change. I mean, I think war is a sort of series of ebbs and flows. We've had some pretty grim times in the past in our own wars, which... Uh, turned out for the better in the long, longer term. But I think 2024 being so important um, in the summer, if the Russians, if the Ukrainians have stopped the Russians from advancing, if some of these weapons come on line, either from America or from elsewhere, if Putin's forces themselves suffer continued attrition, both from men and material, and grind to a halt, then I could be able to claim some degree of optimism. But I think at the moment I'm more in the half empty glass of glass of water on now for unfortunately you left moscow seven months after russia launched its full-scale invasion can you just tell me a bit about what it was like living in moscow at that time and then also what it was what you said when you handed over to your replacement yeah, sure. i mean obviously i think last time we spoke about the run-up to to the war and the misery of ben wallace and just just the incredible pressure we were under and then you know it changed from before the What's going to happen, John? When's it going to happen? To why is it happening? What's happening next? Um, and certainly, I felt myself in that sort of February, March, April time, just you know, unbelievable levels of personal pressure. I've seen my friends in Ukraine being bombed. You know, millions of people evacuated. The thought that Russia might commit hideous war crimes in Ukraine. Then the evidence coming through a place like Butcher, where we could see what the, what the Russians have been up to. And then there's some more, you know, I spent probably the next few months reporting and trying to give balance and objective input into 
uh, Whitehall, both on terms of you know, what's going on and also on terms of policy for the future. But so I handed over after almost three years, and I think I said to him in our brief handover, that's I say to most attaches, is you're not there to go become a supporter for your nation. You need to stay objective and strategic. That's what people read. If you want ministers to read your reporting, you've got to stay at the ministerial level and know your audience back in London. There's no point in sort of providing stuff which gets lost. So that's one is you know, know who you're talking to or what they want to know. I think secondly, you're the only person on the ground from the Ministry of Defence. Now, people read an awful lot of stuff online. I get confronted with it. It's sent to me and say, John, what do you think about this? And I have to dampen down expectations. You're the only one who knows what people look like, what they will talk to you about, what they smell like, you know, what it feels like on the metro and the bus, what's the mood. And I think that's where you provide value above perhaps reading it on things online or on Twitter. Um, I said to him to stay close to our FCO colleagues. There's no time for this sort of traditional FCO, MOD, headbanging. You leave all that to London. You know, we're a very small team. So no staying, department rivalry. Yeah, so I didn't want any of that to play through and so obviously staying close to the ambassador and i also said you know to travel if you could to get out of moscow because moscow is not russia people will talk to you if you go outside and actually find out their mood and what they think about the situation and then you can put build that into your reporting and ultimately don't let the blighters grind you down because as we said that's what they want you to do um but as i said before you know i read a memoir of an attache in russia before the First World War, and they had exactly the same problems that I experienced. So it's never been a particularly easy posting, and it never will be. The Russians are moving forward. Set against that, there have been some remarkable Ukrainian successes. I, for, I would highlight, for example, Ukrainian neutralizing the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. Uh, and to do that without a navy has been really clever by the Ukrainians. They've used drones and long-range precision missiles. Um, so there have been real successes there, uh, and they are fight, and of course Ukrainian hits against uh, Russian energy infrastructure as well. Uh, but I think we have to be pretty gloomy about the prospects for Ukraine this year, and it all comes down to the West not providing the capabilities that Ukraine needs: ammunition, equipment, long-range precision missiles. Of course, the $60 million package in, the, in Washington has been stalled by the impact of Trump on the uh, American run-up to the American election. And unless Ukraine gets the kit, the ammunition, and the long-range missiles that it needs, it is going to continue to go backwards. And that is really bad news. Well, let's come on to that, because in the last 24 hours, we've had the UK Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, visiting Donald Trump in, in Florida. And of course, it is Trump who is seen as being the big kind of blockage in approving this uh, renewed US military aid to Ukraine, because it would appear that, that his supporters in Congress are taking their lead from him. Do you think Donald Trump is persuadable on the issue of Ukraine? Um, I don't know. I don't know that he is. I just simply couldn't comment on Trump. I mean, he's such a uh, I, I think words fail me when I try and, disc you know, there is there is low, precious little logic. There is there is a real irrationality there. And I think we have to be very, very concerned. But the impact of Trump on the election. Um, yes, of course, negative. If Trump gets in, the potential impacts on NATO will be more than negative. But the very threat of a Trump election is forcing NATO now to think very hard about Trump proofing itself. And so the actions, so the work taken, put together at the uh, last week's foreign ministers summit in NATO, for example, the putting together of a hundred billion euro package of measures to Ukraine without Trump, without America, is really good news. And the impact of Trump is forcing European members of NATO, and I'd also include Canada in that, uh, Canada shouldn't be exempt, to think really hard about how they can Trump-proof their, their support for Ukraine. But there's another point here. It's a strategic point. NATO has provided, and America has provided the equipment to, the, the decision has been to provide the equipment needed to avoid Ukrainian defeat. As we've seen, that is not going, that's not still not good enough, and it's running out of sand.
And it's been done with current capability. There has been no mobilization of the military industrial base, no long term ammunition contracts, multi year ammunition contracts uh, uh, agreed with industry. And the consequence of that is that it's not enough. The only thing that is going to work, frankly, is if NATO switches its strategy, not to avoid defeat, but to achieve victory over Russia, because only victory over Russia is going to provide Ukraine and Europe with the security it needs. And allied to that, NATO will have at the same time to put together a very, very powerful and strong deterrent capability around Ukraine to include Ukraine in NATO. And that is something that is going to be with us for generations to come, or at least a generation. Do we need to be more creative as well? I was speaking only last week on Frontline to The Economist, Timothy Ash, who's been very strong on the fact that he believes now is the time, in fact, he thinks we should have done this months ago, to use frozen Russian assets to fund military aid for Ukraine. Should we be looking again at that? Absolutely. And I, I think Timothy Garton Ash is, is, is absolutely on the, on the money there. And, and he's, he's, it's one of very many measures that need to be looked at. And it comes down to boldness, taking risk, and, 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 and sticking heads above parapet. Uh, and, and this comes back to my points about political leadership and moral courage, which, have, which frankly have been lacking. I would also go further and say, we, in, in purely in the military sense, we've got to be creative. Uh, we should rule nothing out to do what needs to be done, including, if necessary, uh, looking at a sort of Scandinavian style limited conscription to overcome the, the problems of army manpower. All these issues have got to be looked at. Nothing should be off the table. What about what, what President Macron intimated a, a few weeks ago about actually sending troops from NATO countries, if not to the front line and certainly to Ukraine? Do you think that is feasible at all? I think it's absolutely feasible. And I think President Macron is absolutely right to be raising these issues. Um, I would say two things. One is uh, President Macron's message would carry much greater weight if France was doing more in terms of supporting uh, Ukraine. If you look at what Germany is providing, uh, France is way, way behind the curve in terms of the actual material and ammunition support. I think the second point I'd make is that the, the, the sending of, mil of NATO military troops to Ukraine is, is, in a sense, the last resort. The way to avoid the last resort is to provide Ukraine with the ammunition, the long-range missiles, and the other capabilities it needs so that you don't have to send uh, NATO troops to Ukraine. Because let's be clear, if you send you, uh, NATO troops to Ukraine in a combat role, that means war between NATO and Russia. And the only way you can do that is if you're ready for war with Russia. And there is no way that NATO is ready for war with Russia right now. I mean, that is very interesting that, that you say that, that, that NATO is not ready for war with Russia, because there might be some who would argue that actually the nature of Vladimir Putin is that you do have to take him head on, that, that appeasement of him will not work and that the West should have been more prepared at this point for potentially, if needs be, taking Putin on head on. And I'm one of those. The only way to deal with Russia is to show strength. Any sign of weakness and Russia will probe and continue to probe and take, take advantage of you. That has always been the Russian way and it continues to be the Russian way. So the only way, the only solution, therefore, is to show strength, is to build up strength, is to build up our armed forces uh, to provide a really cast iron deterrent capability. There can be no appeasement. Appeasement of, 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 uh, of Putin only leads to further grabs on his part. And the only way to offset that is through demonstrating real strength. I'd put it this way. This war in Ukraine is not just a war against Ukraine. Uh, it's a war against Ukraine, it's a war against the West, and it's a war against Ukraine joining the West. This is a war, <laughs> if you ask any Russian, he'll think this is a war against NATO. And if we don't provide Ukraine with the means to achieve victory, be under no illusions. Putin will continue the movement. We are in, we have in Europe, on our eastern border, an angry, revanchist Russia determined to rebuild a Russian empire, determined to swallow up Ukraine. And once it's swallowed up Ukraine, it will move on. It'll move on to Moldova. It'll move on to finish, finish off the occupation, uh, the invasion, uh, finish off, off, off the work it started in Georgia in 2008. 
And it is quite likely to move on to one of the Baltic states, if not all of them, all of whom were part of the Soviet empire and indeed part of the Tsarist empire. So they think of the Baltic states, Russians think of it as theirs. If that happens, that is war with NATO. That is every, that is war, that is Britain engaged in an existential fight with Russia. How much more effective, how much more cost effective to increase defense spending now? Yes, of course, it will impact on infrastructure and transport and, 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 and education and, and the NHS. But I can tell you, unless we do this, we face the prospect of a total catastrophe. And that is why we have to dig deep now. And that is why our political leaders need to explain to British people, the British electorate, what the stakes are, because they're very, very high. Even if Trump does, uh, I think I think there's a high chance that he, even if he doesn't pull America out of the alliance, America would become a sort of sleeping partner in the alliance, mm. still in the alliance, but not exerting the uh, providing the full the full suite of American capability, still able to influence things there. And that's obviously something we would hope for. So even if he doesn't withdraw America from NATO completely, he may well, well, first of all, just cease US military aid to Ukraine, but potentially even push for immediate peace talks with with, with Russia well, he and, said and with he Ukraine. Would stop, which he, would he said he'd end the war in 24 hours. Uh, he said he would encourage Russia to attack any NATO member that doesn't meet the spending uh, requirements. I mean, wild, wild, deeply irresponsible talk. And let's be clear. Ending the war in 24 hours would mean nothing more than another Munich 1938. Putin would rebuild, regain, retrain, at, regenerate, and have another go at finishing the work he started uh, in 2014. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more on global security and the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Times Radio, take out a digital subscription to The Times, and click subscribe on our YouTube channel.